Hello, Frizzle Fighters. Just when I thought that the Vorkosican series couldn't get any better, it gives me a book like Memory, which is unquestionably now my favorite of the series. Well, I say unquestionably, but honestly, like so many books are so close and I haven't read them all. So we'll see if it can serve me up something I like even more, but it's a masterpiece. Now, when I first started reading Memory, I was kind of lukewarm about it because it starts off so slow. It starts off kind of boring of Miles just waiting around for his next assignment, kind of stewing in his past mistakes. And I was sitting there thinking like, come on guys, where is the space battles? Where are things getting out of control? Give me something. And our main character, Miles, was also like, yeah, I know how things work. Like, where are the things going out of control? Where is my mission? And he was just as impatient as I was for this book to get itself in gear. What was happening? And I was starting to wonder, like, why does this book have such a high rating? But then I figured it out and it is entirely deserved. Many of the books in this series play a lot with different pushing and pulling ideas. We have different cultures coming into contact with each other, different ideologies. But one of the biggest arcs of the last few books of this series has been Miles Vorkosigan versus Miles Naismith. Miles Vorkosigan is his birth name, and this is the persona that he is when he is at home. It is the prince of this important political countship. It is someone who cares deeply about his home world, but isn't always done right by the home world. However, for the last decade, he has been off being a mercenary in space under the name of Miles Naismith, pretending to be a different person. And he has grown into this persona so much that it has become more of his default self. And the Vorkosigan planet side feels like the act, feels like the mask that he's putting on. Because he likes fighting battles out in space and having missions and having everything be fast paced. But now, at the beginning of this book, he has been summoned home to the planet of Beriar. He has to play being Vorkos again. And then the worst thing that could possibly happen to Miles, our main character, happens as he gets fired from being Miles Naismith and loses that persona all together. What is he supposed to do now? Being the commander of this mercenary fleet, which he has now lost, was his whole identity, was his whole life, what he was working towards, what he was fighting for. And now it is irrevocably gone. And this novel is Miles's journey of rebuilding himself from the ground up after this disaster. <sighs> So yes, it starts off slow. And through the whole book, we do not get pitched battles with people's lives on the line. We just get Miles wrestling with himself, wrestling with temptation and trying to figure out what he stands for and works for now that the thing that he did work for and stand for has been ripped away from him due to his own idiocy and negligence. In this one novel, every beat is perfect. Slow paced is exactly what this story needs to tell it. And by the end of the book, Miles has rebuilt himself and found his roots again, so that even when commanding that mercenary fleet is offered to him, he gets it back. He's grown enough that he turns it down. And that is storytelling. Before reading the novel Memory, if you had told me that Miles would lose his fleet and that the series would completely shift in tone and somewhat genre, I would have been upset. I would have thought that these new books would be awful, but somehow it gets even better because it's all earned, because it's all fought for by this character. And coming off the heels of the book Memory, the next books in the series Komar and a civil campaign have shifted. Before this, the series was of the genre of like space adventure, but now it's like careful mystery and comedy of manners because Miles has shifted from fleet admiral to mystery solver, investigator on his home planet. And in the novel Memory, he's given his first mystery to solve, which is a heartbreaking degradation on the mental capacity of one of his friends that is thought to maybe be sabotage. And these heartbreaking scenes of Miles with his friend and father figure Ilian, as Ilian's mental capacities are degrading, were some of the most heartbreaking scenes I have ever read. Because it was all earned. Because we had gotten to know their relationship. We had gotten to know Simon both throughout the series and some chapters at the beginning of this book. And after I had read Memory and the books after it, Komar and a Civil Campaign, they were just 
still in the back of my mind. Most of all, memory. If we are to liken my brain to a laptop with too many tabs open in the background, the novel memory was at least three of them. <laughs> And so two days ago, I reread the novel Memory already. Like I just read it for the first time a few weeks ago. And now I've already reread it. And I was even more impressed with this book the second time around because there is so much subtle foreshadowing in this tale for both the looming mystery and for the thematic content to follow. And when I was first reading the book, I not only didn't appreciate all of this careful foreshadowing, I didn't even realize it was foreshadowing because it's done so subtly and carefully. And yet it gets intermixed with the premise of this book as such a strong foundation that it just makes all of the punches hit that much harder. I feel like in the average book series, if the main character was suffered such a blow that he lost everything he'd been fighting for up to that point in the series, the happy ending at the end of that book would be him fighting for that again and getting it back. But the happy and satisfying and triumphal ending of memory is the opposite, is him rejecting what was once his dream because of his intense character growth throughout the book. <sighs> it's masterful. It is a book on a new plane of transcendence compared to the average novel, and I am so floored by how smartly done it is. And so memory catapults us into the next book of the series, Komar, where the status quo has shifted. As someone who has become a bit of a connoisseur of reading series out of order and starts looking for that nowadays, if you were itching to start the Warcosigan saga somewhere in the latter half, I think Komar is the best place for it so far. And that is also backed up by the author's recommended reading order post. Like it's not the best starting place for the series, but if you really hate fast paced books, if the idea of reading a series with like space battles and stuff is not what you are looking for and what you are looking for instead is slow political investigations that happen to happen in space and some really good character development and a dual perspective romance, if that is what you are looking for, the Vorkosigan series has it. And you can start here with the book Komar to get it. And yes, you heard me right. This is a dual perspective romance novel. We have the usual perspective of Miles, and then we have his love interest perspective, Ekaterin. Miles has been chasing girls for this entire series, and sometimes he gets lucky. And then of course he gets unlucky because he's always running into problems. And starting off this new phase of his life, He's recently lost his girl and is kind of looking for a new one. And when I was first going into Komar and I realized we were adding in the perspective of Miles' new love interest, Ekaterin, I was apprehensive. I admit I did not trust this book series enough. I thought that it was going to fall into the trap that I've seen other book series do of only giving the love interest chapters from her perspective for the love plot, but not giving her her own satisfying plot. <sighs> of course, these books are on a new plane of existence and they do not fall into these normal traps. I mean, I'm exaggerating. I think the only book that's on a new plane of existence is memory. The rest of them are just really good and my new obsessions. So with Miles, we get an interesting plot where he has been handed political and potentially criminal and treasonous mystery to solve with his new investigator office. And he is trying to grow into this office and figure out what this means and who the new him is after he's changed so much in the past book. But Ekaterin, our new narrator, I think is the one that steals the show of this book because she has her own journey to go on that is only tangentially related to the arrival of Miles Vorkosigan into her life where she is stuck in a bad marriage and she cares very much about her vows, about her duty to her husband and her like 10 year old kid. But also this marriage is crushing her because there is no love between her and her husband. But she is going to tough it out because she is a tough woman who cares deeply about her integrity. But then throughout this book, that integrity is prodded and poked and brought into question. And she's presented with new challenges where both options make her a traitor to some of her moral code. And she has to make tough decisions and figure out who she is independent of her husband. What really is the core of her integrity? And who does she really want to build her life with? And is she bold enough to make that decision for herself and not wait for permission from someone else? 
and in this book, Miles falls in love with Ekaterin. Of course, I love all the characters in this series. So as soon as I got her perspective, I was also in love with Ekaterin and I shipped them so hard because they're really good for each other. Would I describe this book as a romance? I would say the first focus of this book is the investigation mystery. And then the next focus is Ekaterin coming into her own and becoming more bold. And the third focus gets to be Miles's character arc of coming into his own in this new role as investigator and really finding his balance there. And then the fourth focus is their budding romance and flirtationship with each other. It's not until the next book that we really get the romance novel of the series. And before I move on to talking about the next book, A Civil Campaign, I've got another praise to give to Komar, which is it's particularly good techno babble. I noticed this also reading an earlier book in the series, Sita Ganda, and sprinkled throughout some other ones. But when this science fiction series decides to do science, it does it right! It's so Great! I'm a physics nerd and an engineer. I know how to talk science. Many novels that try do not know how to talk science, and it is painful to read sometimes. And I'm gonna say there are three main traps that the average science fiction book will fall into when trying to talk science. Either the science is just flat out wrong. Like, I'm okay if the science gets stretched a little bit, this is fiction, but like, more than stretched, broken in half, and scattered the corpses of. Next pet peeve of mine is when the scientists don't talk with each other like scientists. They talk like they're exposition machines to the reader. Like it's just not realistic dialogue. And then three is when there's just too much of it and it gets too sciencey. Like I'm not reading these novels to read a science textbook. Some of it, yeah, I like it. But too much of it, I don't like it. And the average person who isn't a physics nerd is going to opt out of it way faster than I will. And this series avoids all of the traps. <laughs> What if there are scientists talking about like the wormhole jumps or the interesting neural implants or anything? The science makes sense, is how actual scientists talk and isn't too much of it. And I love it. It's exactly the flavor of science that I want to find in my science fiction novels. And now we get to talk about a civil campaign, which has completed the genre shift of this series in a masterful way. I am not the type of person who typically loves the comedy of manners genre, which I would define as like a romance that isn't propelled by the two characters trying to sweep each other off their feet. It isn't propelled by the love and the angst of the couple. It's propelled by the societal structures that they find themselves in. It's propelled by their little mistakes and solutions that are roadblocks in the way. It's more of like a romance after the way of Jane Austen than a romance after the way of a rom-com. And a civil campaign features a wedding and three love plots of some of our main characters throughout the book. And it's a comedy of manners all the way through. Like there is very little plot outside of that. And I loved it. And I only loved this book because I've spent so long in this series getting to know all of these characters, getting invested and in seeing them find their romantic happily ever afters. And then this book is them doing this. And it was enchanting. It was done so well, paced so finely. This book is following Miles and his brother Mark and his cousin Ivan as they desperately try to woo their respective potential partners. And the thing about these three characters and the perspectives we get from their love interests, like Ekaterin again, is that they all have flaws that stop them from being good at courting people. For example, Miles is still so much in the headspace of planning missions. And he plans his courtship like a surprise attack without thinking much about the feelings of the girl he's courting. It's classic Miles. He's ridiculously egotistic and loves a surprise attack. This is not how you ask a girl to marry you. And so in this book, in order for him to be worthy of this girl by the end, he has to go through some intense character development and figuring out how to consider her feelings and approaching the romance in a more honest way instead of a strategic way. Contrastly, his cousin Ivan has a different problem. He's great at wooing girls and being kind to them. His problem is commitment. And so Ivan gets a side plot where instead of learning to accept romantic commitment, he first has to learn how to accept political commitment because he's always weaseling out of the hard political jobs. He's willing to lend a hand if people beg him into it, but he doesn't do much under his own power and motivation. He's just trying to stay neutral. He finally can't 
do that anymore. He has to step up and be the hero who has to save the day. He has to accept responsibility and commitment to his friends, even when it's sticky and difficult. And that's exactly what he needed to learn in order to be ready for a long-term commitment. And it's just done so well. I do think Mark's romance is the weakest of the three. Most of the big character development moments is instead given to his love interest, Kareem Kadelka, which is of course really well done. After I finished this book, I was thinking that it really doesn't have as much big action plot as the typical Vorkosigan book up to this point. And I was asking myself, would this book be better if we had given it more of an action plot, more of an action-y adventure type feel? And I think, no. A civil campaign is full of entertainment enough. And giving it an action adventure set piece would only clutter it because it's so tightly woven and paced as it is that I was able to have a blast with it. I rated all of these books five stars, as I have all the other books in this series. And a big thank you to my patrons. If you would like to join the patrons, you can look forward to such perks as a monthly online book club and a bonus and extended videos. This is the book we're reading next in the book club. And subscribe for more videos from me on Frizzle Fridays.